Wow, we have a very, very special guest today, tonight, actually, here in Switzerland. Professor Norman Finkelstein, American political scientist, activist, and author of many enlightened uh, books. You're a specialist of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and it is an absolute uh, honor to have you with us, Norman. Well, thank you for having me. I know you don't like to be put in a pedestal, but uh, you are an incredible uh, warrior for humanity and a uh, giant of justice, and uh, I thank you for that infinitely. So, Norman, how are you dealing with this crisis? Confined? Are you confined? Are you stuck in your house? Um, my lifestyle really didn't change in any significant respect. I have been out of work for 12 years uh, since 2007. And so most of my life is spent at home uh, reading, writing, answering a lot of email. Um, so that aspect of my life hasn't changed that much. I, I used to, uh, in the afternoons, I would go swimming at the uh, nearby pool, and that changed. And that was actually a disappointment. Yeah, I guess. Um, but now I start to run along the seashore. I live near the beach. Uh, so all in all, it hasn't affected me. Um, this, I, I was teaching for the first time in 12 years. I was teaching... And that was a very positive experience. And that then abruptly moved online. And online experience, it's not a disaster, but it's not the same thing as a classroom. Mm. Uh, so um, I was very excited, the prospect of re-entering <clears throat> re the classroom. Mm -hmm. And s soon enough that became Zoom. <laughs> um, okay. That's really it. You know, there have been uh, there have been deaths. Nobody very close to me, but people who were close to people who were close to me. Mm. And um, there's just a general depression that's overcome our society uh, combined with the monumental corruption and incompetence that have been revealed by the crisis. Um, Trump is just a <laughs> complete buffoon. Yeah. It's not even funny. Yeah, we will talk I, about that. I, I have failed at this point to see the humor in it. Mm. You simply have to be aghast Absolutely. at the fact that such, that such a complete imbecile. Yeah, from far, from far. Occupying mm. the most powerful position on the planet. And then every time a so-called stimulus bill is passed or you corruption. know it's going to be more corruption, more thievery um, by the rich, such that they'll probably end up doing better financially than if there hadn't been a COVID virus. Uh, it's a very sorry insight into what a depraved, decayed society uh, Americans live in. I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I, I have a sense of humor and I like to laugh, but I have to say my humor or my funny bone has been eroded by the spectacle of um, America in the Trump era 
as it passes through a pandemic. I understand that, obviously. We will come back to uh, Trump and politics uh, a little bit uh, later, if you if you're okay. And also maybe 12 years ago, what happened to you? But first, I wanted to pay tribute to the courageous Pal Palestinian people. And uh, in the conclusion of your book, Gaza, uh, an inquest into its martyrdom, uh, in the conclusion, uh, you uh, start the chapter with the UN question, will Gaza be a livable place in 2020? We are now in 2020. Uh, so is Gaza a livable place now? This is a bit rhetorical because I know the horror, but just to start on that subject. Um, it depends. <clears throat> depends on what you mean by livable. Are people physically surviving? The answer is yes. Is this a life? The answer is no. Uh, the truth is, because Gaza has experienced so many human-made catastrophes that they have developed a capacity to endure and to survive even under the most onerous, the most burdensome conditions. I was actually at the beginning of the COVID uh, epidemic, pandemic, and people were speculating about Gaza. I actually wrote emails saying, I'm not really that worried because people in Gaza have learned how to handle every kind of crisis, even amidst its population density and its poverty. I figured they're going to get through this. Don't ask me how, but there's enough social cohesion, enough sense of collective, uh, a collective esprit de corps, that somehow they were going to make it. And so far, I was, I have been so far, I don't know what tomorrow will bring, so far I've been proven right. There have been cases reported. It seems most of them are from returning um, workers or family members. Uh, but I hate my friend, my good friend, Sarah Roy, says she's the world's leading authority in Gaza's economy. Uh, and she says she's come to hate the word resilient. Mm. Uh, Gazans are always described as resilient and almost becomes an excuse for doing nothing because, well, they're resilient, they'll survive. Uh, so I'm not going to use the word resilient. I will simply say I think they've developed the collective capacity to survive situations, conditions, which anybody else would call unlivable. So, for example, you hear or read headlines about our, our meaning the U.S. unemployment rate reaching unprecedented levels. Now, it's now in the order of around 8%. And already in the U.S., that's considered a catastrophe of the first magnitude. In the case of Gaza, unemployment is typically around 40 to 50 percent. It's the highest unemployment rate in the world. And among youth, it's about 70 percent. So... 8% in the U.S. is considered a catastrophe. The worst projections right now 
the worst projections are in the US, it may go up to 25 to 30%. That's the worst projections. Uh, while in Gaza, that would be a, a state of bliss if their unemployment were down to 25 to 30 percent. It's not to in any way extenuate the horror. It's just to say objectively, I had this intuition that they would figure out even among that population density, which is the equivalent of riding a New York City subway at rush hour, that's their population density 24-7, 365, so that obviously what's called social distancing is not an option there. But I still thought they would figure it out Hmm. I wish, if I had one little wish, it would be that some person in Gaza, with all his or her ingenuity, figures out the vaccine for the virus, putting to shame all the laboratories in the world. Little Gaza found the vaccine. That would be a giant F you to the rest of the world. Absolutely. Yeah. So if I interviewed you today, it's not only because I, I admire you and um, uh, for your strength of pursuing justice, but it's also because the, our media here in Switzerland is failing to address uh, the, one of the most important conflicts, uh, in my uh, opinion, that is uh, the Israeli-Palestinian one. And to me, it's so, if you take a little bit of, of time, it's so easy to, to see who is oppressed and who is the oppressor. But still, the, our media are, are putting the, the two ki kind of in balance. You know, it's the fault of both. It's also, our, also a reason why we actually created this podcast uh, less than a year ago. Because it seems for some people, uh, for the reason I don't know, you may you may tell me that uh, it, it's hard to actually pursue truth and justice as you do. Can you add on that? Well, I don't think the answer is very complicated. First of all, as you say. The situation itself <clears throat> is not from either a moral or a political perspective. It's not a complicated situation. Israel has been carrying on in a criminal fashion in the West Bank and Gaza for the past half century, which is not a trivial period of time. It's huge. Uh, to be carrying on atrocities sustained atrocities over a half century uh, is in itself just the length of time, the duration, that in itself is a significant indicator of the magnitude of the criminality. Uh, and beyond that, there has been a solution within reach for the past 50, a little less, you know, you'd say the occupation begins in 1967. So you'd say since the 1970s, there's been a, a political solution possible, but it has been blocked by Israel and abetted by the United States. Why these elementary truths are not widely known or as widely known as they should be, mm -hmm. it's a mixture, it's a, it's a combination of intimidation by the Jewish lobby, 
I don't really accept anymore the argument about guilt feelings among Europeans. Uh, the Europeans know exactly what's going on. They don't feel guilty about the Nazi Holocaust. They, the, the Jewish or pro-Israel lobby, they're thuggish. They are ruthless. Uh, and they can destroy careers, destroy lives, uh, tamper with, as in the case of the United Kingdom, tamper with elections. Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, the Jeremy Corbyn uh, phenomenon. Mm, we'll discuss about And that also on the other side, there's among ruling elites or elite opinion, uh, there's just an awful lot of sheer cowardice and uh, unwillingness to pay any price for telling the truth. Now, in some cases, I'll agree the price can be quite high. But in some cases, it's just the most pitiful opportunism combined with cowardice. And the other factor which I don't consider the main factor, but it is a factor, is the Palestine the movement itself became so corrupt and so uninspiring that the Palestinian people effectively have given up and are now trying to each each doing his or her utmost to survive individually as against looking for a collective solution. So the mentality is now very much the French expression, which I remember was South keep up, every man for himself. Mm. And so the Soul struggle keeper. died. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the struggle died. And therefore, the kinds of moral pressure that might have been exerted by a powerful movement among Palestinians, that moral pressure has dissipated, it's scattered. And so nobody feels any longer a strong need to even put on a pretense of caring about the Palestinians. They've been forgotten. Now, um, there are many reasons the multiplicity of crises, uh, uh, human crises in the Arab world, whether it's Syria, Libya, Iraq, Yemen, a little farther afield, Afghanistan, there are just so many humanitarian catastrophes in the Arab world that the Palestinian struggle now has been um, dwarfed by them. And then you have the fact that a large number of Arab states are openly aligning with Israel. <clears throat> so that too has reduced the salience of the Palestinian cause. Then there is the corruption within the Palestinian leadership who are for all intents and purposes collaborators with Israel. Uh, and then you have combined with that uh, the factors I already discussed. Um, and so the picture is very bleak now. Mm. My spouse is actually from South Africa and she lived, uh, well, obviously the apar apartheid state, which ended in 1991. And uh, her recollection, uh, she's um, colored, so she's, she, she was not the worst off 
uh, there, but her recollection um, is hard, but it's, it's, it's not as anything close to what we hear or see uh, in what happening in, in Israel, in Palestine, in fact. Um, uh, I've heard you compare Israel to uh, apartheid. Is it, is it comparable? It depends on what dimension you look at. If you look at the legal dimension, I think the arguments that have been made by respected and knowledgeable experts, whether it be someone like John Dugard or a large number of people, it's pointless to go through the whole list uh, at this point, who say that Israel has created an apartheid regime. Uh, that seems to me, it's not really even debatable anymore because I think there is a misunderstanding of how to conceive intellectually or mentally the crisis, the, the situation there. People like Dugard and others, John Dugard and others, Professor Dugard, very smart and very honorable guy, who's also from South Africa, incidentally. Uh, he was Nelson Mandela's lawyer. He was, um, oh, his name just slipped my mind. Tutu. He was this man, Tutu. Desmond Tutu's lawyer. Um, Dugard and many others, they focus on the apartheid regime in the West Bank. Uh, the, two, the two legal systems, uh, the two different tiers of rights and so forth. Others say that Israel itself is an apartheid regime because of the various discriminations suffered by Palestinian Israelis. But to my thinking, the proper comparison is Israel has effectively, Israel has effectively annexed the whole of the West Bank and Gaza. There is one state, one state between the Mediterranean and the um, Jordan rivers. There's one state. Uh, now, Israel may have not legally annexed the West Bank, but de facto it has annexed the West Bank. And so you have one state between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. And that one state, the overwhelming number of Palestinians have no rights whatsoever. And you can say the Israeli Palestinians or Palestinian Israelis, you would say they have more rights than West Bank and Gaza Palestinians, but less rights than Israeli Palestinians. So they would be, they would occupy a position pretty close to the position your spouse occupied in South Africa. Israeli Palestinians or Palestinian Israelis occupy today basically the same position as what were called colors in South Africa and the overwhelming mass of Palestinians occupy a position similar to blacks in South Africa. Uh, so I think that if you properly conceptualize uh, the geography of the situation, it's one state. And in that one state, about 4 million Palestinians uh, you'd say the total population of that one state would be there are about roughly 8 million Israelis 
of those, and then if you add the 4 million Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, you have about 12 million people. Of those 12 million people, 4 million Palestinians have no rights. Another one and a half million have less rights than Israeli Jews. So it would come to about half the population have full rights. Uh, a third of the population has no rights and then some occupied a position of color. So legally, it's more or less, I would say, like uh, the situation in South Africa uh, during the apartheid years. Hmm. The one big difference, which is not a, it's not a trivial di difference, but it's a socioeconomic difference. South Africa never wanted to get rid of the black people because it needed them as a labor force. It wanted to denationalize them. That is to say, set up these fake states uh, and give South African blacks citizenship in these uh, fake states, uh, both with Botswana, um, Transkei, Siskei, uh, what were called Bantustans, uh, Israel doesn't want Palestinian labor, has no interest in it whatsoever. It would be very happy if all the Palestinians disappeared. And no doubt its long-term goal is one of two things. One, that in the course of some apocalyptic war, say, as the November election approaches in the U.S., and Donald Trump's uh, ratings or prospects seem poor, he might pick a war with Iran. It would become a regional conflagration very quickly. And then the Israelis will use the cover of the war to carry out a mass expulsion. And the other possibility is they will just continue to make the situation so unlivable that over time, it would take time, but large numbers of people would just leave. Right now, for example, if Gazans could, probably 80% would pack up and leave now if they had that option. So that's one big difference with South Africa. The South African pop, or South African whites did not want the black people to leave, but Israel would be nothing. Nothing would make them happier if they opened up their eyes one day, got up in the morning, and discovered there are no Palestinians. Actually, Israel would be happy if everybody in the Middle East disappeared except them. Actually, Israel's, Israelis are such racist supremacists, they would be happy if the whole world disappeared except <laughs> for mm. them, mm. or to use the rest of the world as slaves, you know, because they're uber mentioned. They're so superior. They're so, um, so much more important. I remember the very first week, the very first week, of the COVID virus, just when it started. An Israeli announces, I have a cure. I have a vaccine. Go back and look. You'll see it's all over there. Oh, I've seen it. The, Israel I've seen it. the Israeli supermen, they came up with a they fired, they came up with a vaccine in 24 hours, you know? I knew it was a lot of crap. And I had some Israeli friend and uh, no an American Jewish friend and his Israeli girlfriend were over at my place. I said, it's just crap. Israelis are great at branding. We have the cure. Oh, it may take 10 years to test, but we have the cure, <laughs> you know. And everyone believes it. Everybody falls for it. You know, the Ubermensch, the Superman. Mm -hmm. So as I said, they'd be happy. Maybe, you know, 
They don't want everybody to disappear because they need somebody to do the dirty work. They need untermensch, but they would like them at least to disappear from uh, Israel. Nelson Mandela was in solidarity with the Palestinian people, obviously, and people tend to forget that as well. Uh, and it's so bizarre that in, in, in Israel, they need actually new historian. They call that new historian with Benny Morris, Ilan Pape, Avishlai, Muslomo Sand. Like if story is old or new, that's also a bizarre thing to witness, to be honest. I'm not sure I understand your point. Maybe you can rephrase it. Um, what I'm saying is um, the, the narrative that the Zionist wants to push seems to be then questioned by a new generation from the 80s of uh, historian, but it, it's so polarized that they have to call them new historians. That's bizarre. You're a historian or you're not historian, but why do you call new historian? Like if there's two story. Well, at the time, there were actually some of those people who you say, who you mention, mm -hmm. uh, who said that we're actually not new historians, we're the first historians, mm -hmm. because the first generation were mostly propagandists. They were servants of their state, disseminating myths in order to defend their state. And it took a period when Israel became politically and militarily secure, such that there was a younger generation who felt they can air the dirty laundry in public and not jeopardize Israel's survival uh, and is Israel's stability. Now, I suppose you should bear in mind, because you appear to be a young man, we we're talking about quite a long time ago already. We we're talking about 30 years ago. So some of the new historians have passed across the spectrum. <clears throat> uh, Benny Morris is now a right winger. Mm, I've heard that, uh, yeah. Uh, because the political spectrum in Israel has moved so far to the right that in order to be, so to speak, relevant in that society, you have to be, you have to keep pace with the movement, uh, the, the broad consensus, what they call in Israel, the national consensus. And that's moved or sometimes it's called the Zionist consensus. And that's moved very far to the right. So people like Benny Morris moved to the right as the consensus moved to the right. Uh, Ilan Pape left Israel and went to the UK. Avi Shleim left very early Israel and went to Oxford. Uh, so the number of actual, quote unquote, new historians who are still new historians and who live in Israel, you can count in the fingers of your hand. You know, there just not, aren't that many. Israel is a, uh, a um, new right country, which makes it kind of unusual because there is obviously a large number of countries where the far right has come into power, whether it's um, the United States or Brazil or India or the Philippines or Hungary, uh, where the far right has come into power. What makes Israel slightly, not significantly different in my opinion is in most of the countries I named, there's still a fairly powerful leftist movement 
that or left of center movement um, in Brazil, the workers movement, probably in the new election. Well, they would have won even in the last election if Lula hadn't been um, jailed. Uh, in the case of the UK, um, there is still a labor left. It's not a great labor left, but it's still, it was powerful enough that it catapulted for a period Jeremy, Cor Jeremy Corbyn into a leadership position. In the United States, I'm still completely convinced that had Bernie's Sanders, if his movement hadn't been sabotaged by the Democratic Party leadership, he would have defeated Trump in uh, November. I have very little doubt about that. Uh, Biden is a corpse, an Egyptian mummy, and even he, even this corpse, uh, is still polling better than Trump right now. Uh, Bernie, I think, would have destroyed Trump. But Israel is different. There's no left in Israel. There's not even a center in Israel. One should be mad. clear about that. This is there's mad. no left. There's no center. There's a right and a further right and a further right. That's the three divisions in Israel. So you take somebody like Gantz, who was uh, Netanyahu's major opponent in the last elections. Gantz ran his campaign on how he destroyed Gaza. He ran pictures, commercials, showing the devastation he presided over during Operation Protective Edge in 2014. That's how he sold himself. They both have said they favor radical annexation of the West Bank. The only difference is where to start. Uh, for Netanyahu, we start from the, Jor the Jordan Valley and we go west. For Gans, we start from the settlement blocks and we go east. That's the only difference. Uh, it's a it's an unusual country because, as I said, it's a, a far right without even a center. Now maybe that's true in some of the Eastern European countries like Hungary, but in general, it's a very unusual situation. So you have to distinguish between countries which currently have far-right governments or far-right states and places like Israel, which is a far-right country. It's not just the government. It's not just a portion of society. It's the whole of society has moved on the mass with only a tiny, tiny, uh, ha a handful of exceptions all the way over in the spectrum. It's a Ubermenschen state, the Superman state. Hmm. In, from a European perspective, it was also a bizarre thing to witness the socialist, the French so socialist party with Francois Hollande, a socialist leftist party praising and being friend with a racist, thuggish and criminal government as Netanyahu uh, and other. To me, it's astonishing, but maybe I'm, I'm, there's something I don't see. Is it, is it the same uh, argument you made earlier with the media, the cowardice and, and, and all that? How do you explain that a leftist... No, I wouldn't say it's only coward. In the case of people like that, look, the French Socialist Party does not have a very distinguished record. It's dead now. Back, it's, it's, it's dead know, now. Go back to the Algerian War, uh, even the role of Mitterrand, I guess it came out after his death that he had been a collaborator with the Nazis. He was the head of the French Socialist Party. 
during its triumph, triumphant reign of power, uh, the French Socialist Party has a very ugly record, uh, in particular during the Algerian War, which was really quite brutal. You know, the estimates now, you can never say with these estimates, but they estimate maybe a million, a million and a half even uh, Algerians were killed uh, during the, uh, the uh, French repression there. Um, so um, I don't have high expectations of these people. If you read now what's going on in the UK with the Labour Party, mm, yeah, no, I think one person after another just can each try to exceed the other in his or her um, sycophancy genuflection to the British Jewish community. It's a pitiful sight to behold, uh, preventing any criticism now within the Labour Party, any criticism of Israel, prohibiting it, uh, threatening you with ouster if you criticize any aspect of Israeli po policy. Uh, part of it is for sure cowardice. Part of it is careerism. Mm -hmm. Part of it is opportunism. But part of it is they identify with uh, the Ubermenschen, with the Superman. Um, if you are, uh, there's an interesting fact that a lot of these far right parties in Europe are led by people who are not rhetorically, but factually, they are anti-Semites. They do not like Jews, and they claim their origins in anti-Semitic parties from the interwar era, interwar meaning between World War I and World War II. And that posed an interesting question. The question is, why do these far-right parties have such a deep affection for Israel? Hmm. Now, part of it is the anti-Semitic belief, because they think Jews control the world, Jews control the White House, and so in order to get to Trump, you have to go via Israel, because it's the Jews who control the White House. The Jews are the wire pullers, as it used to be said. And so to get to Trump, you have to get to Israel and the Jews. So part of it is anti-Semitism. And I would say, no, that's a pretty strong factor. Uh, but the other factor is, and it's for me the more interesting one, they don't consider Israel Jewish. They see Israel as a white ubermenschen state. And the Jewish dimension for most of these people is neither here nor there. They see the same white supremacist, anti-xenophobic, anti uh, xenoph anti-xenophobic, anti-immigrant, loathing of color, the dark-skinned Muslim people. Xenophobic. They see that in play, in action, in power, in Israel. So they just see Israel as one more, uh, albeit very successful, but one more white supremacist state like their own. And so... For them, Israel is not a Jewish country. Israel is a um, country of ubermenschen, mm -hmm. white supremacists. Now, as I said, that coexists, that belief that Israel is not really a Jewish state, it coexists with the belief that Jews control all the centers of power 
most importantly, the United States. And so in order to get in the good graces of the United States, in the Trump White House, you have to be um, deferential to Israel. And so you see things like countries like uh, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Uganda, uh, Ethiopia, they're now voting with Israel in the United Nations. And a lot of the reason they vote now with Israel in the United Nations is they think, well, if we support the Jews, they're going to do us a favor with Trump. Mm -hmm. So it's a odd combination of believing the anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy theories. Well, there's an element of truth to it. If you know you um, defer to Israel, you vote the right way at the UN, or you vote the right way uh, at the International Criminal Court, I mean, they'll do you a favor. They may open up a door, a window of the White House to you. So there's an element of truth in those conspiracy theories, though the notion that the Jews control all the power centers is uh, obviously a gross exaggeration, obviously. Uh, but that coexists with the belief that Israelis are not Jews. And in many ways, Israelis aren't Jews. It's true. Israelis are not Jewish. If you look at the historical Jewish type, uh, the historical Jewish type is kind of like a Franz Kafka, this scrawny Jew with big ears, or in the United States, a Woody Allen. Uh, and then, of course, there's the very successful Jews in business, in the, in, um, in the professions, lawyers, doctors. Uh, Israel's principal characteristic, until recently, with the Silicon Valley, it's created for itself, the high-tech industry. Until recently, its main distinguishing feature was its military might it's martial prowess. That's not Jewish. There are, many, there are many Jews who are famous in history for many things. Military commanders is not one of them. Fighters and murderers is not one of them. That's not our uh, branding. So in many ways, I think it's correct to say Israel is not a Jewish place. Not very Jewish at all. There is the this tendency uh, we hear to link uh, Zionism uh, with anti-Zionism uh, anti with anti-Semitism. It's 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 been a long way, I think, but it's strong now. Even uh, Emmanuel Macron he called the the two terms, and we've seen uh, in UK too with Corbyn. They even did uh, like a show Intelligence Square UK where they bring up this question, is uh, anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism? Th that's I, so I crazy. Uh, How do we deal with that? The best way to deal with it is not to use language or terminology, which becomes very quickly a distraction. What happens when you engage in debates like that is... You end up arguing about what is Zionism, yep. and you end up talking about Jewish history, and then you end up talking about whether Jews are a nation or are Jews a people, and you then just find yourself having been lured on this path, onto this path, an endless path of Jewish navel gazing and Jewish self-absorption, and you end up just talking about Jews. Whereas I think the right thing to do is to stick closely to the factual record and discuss the policies, the implementation of the policies of the state of Israel. I don't much care whether what they do 
springs from Zionism, springs from Kantianism, springs from Platoism, or springs from Hitlerism. I'm not really interested in those questions. I'm more interested in what is Israel doing? Is this criminal policy? Is this policy deserving of condemnation, sanctions, and so forth? That to me is the relevant question. Everything else, as Professor Chomsky would say, everything else is worthy of a graduate seminar class, but it has very little to do with politics. Or it becomes, okay, it has a political dimension. I don't want to deny that. Um, but it becomes a kind of distraction. Hmm. The moment you start talking about Zionism, you find yourself talking about questions which put the situation of the Palestinians uh, in, on the back burner. Hmm. And that's, I think, in advance. Israel loves to talk about Zionism. Great, let's talk about Zionism. Let's talk about Jews. Let's talk about Jewish history. Let's talk about the Jewish people. Let's talk about the Jewish nation. And by the way, let's also talk about anti-Semitism. And let's not forget the Holocaust. And then the, the, the core concern, which ought to be if you're a political person, to mitigate the suffering of the Palestinians, it gets forgotten. Absolutely. About the, then the, the plan of the century by Jared Kushner, mm -hmm. uh, this is also reasonable. I mean, your son-in-law then goes and solves the mo most complex... It's not uh, a complex problem. No, it's not. Okay. Oh, no, I don't think it's complex mm -hmm. at all. But the fact the of the matter is, uh, Jared Kushner is an imbecile. He's a, 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 a uh, privileged, spoiled brat, this entitled creep in his Yves Saint Laurent suits, who never did a thing in his life or accomplished or achieved a thing in his life without the money from his father. His father bought his way, his meaning Jared's way, into Harvard. The year he applied, his father gave Harvard a two and a half million dollar gift based on his grades, his academic performance, his test scores. Everybody in his school agreed that he would never have gotten into Harvard. Everything, and his father is among the most despicable, depraved creeps in the world of billionaires. In the world of billionaires, you have to be a real low life to be among the most depraved. His father uh, had a quarrel with his brother-in-law, namely his sister's husband. His father's name is Charles Kushner. He hired a prostitute to seduce his brother-in-law, then had the seduction videotaped, and then presented the videotape to his sister uh, on some family holiday. He ended up, now you have to remember, Charles Kushner is an Orthodox or conservative Jew, uh, modern Orthodox it's called, a modern Orthodox Jew, He's a billionaire. He's in New Jersey, right across the way from New York. Jared's father, Charles uh, Kushner, he ended up in jail for a year. And let me tell you, Jewish billionaires in New Jersey don't usually end up in jail. You have to be the lowest of the low life to end up in jail. But he ended up in jail for a year. Yeah, Jared's father was in jail. You'll never read that in American papers. You'll never read that in American papers. That Jared's dad was in jail. 
that J J uh, Jared's father entrapped his brother-in-law by hiring a prostitute to seduce him and then videotaped it. That's the Kushner family. That's the Kushner family. Jared is a complete imbecile, a twit. Um, and the, the plan, he, he didn't produce any plan. Israel produced the plan and they gave it to him. And the plan basically says Israel will annex. There are differences because the plan itself, the map, didn't show the actual percentages that Israel will annex. Uh, some of the best topographers say Israel would annex 30% of the West Bank, according to the, black, the map. My guess is it's 40%. So Israel would take between 30 and 40% of the West Bank. There would be these isolated little dots of Palestinian self-government surrounded by the Jewish settlements, the all Jewish roads and everything. Um, and then if, Israel and the United States decide, if Israel and the United States decide that the Palestinians have created a Western democracy, now this will be decided on by Trump and Netanyahu, uh, if they've created a Western democracy, then Israel might grant these tiny islands of Palestinian self-government amidst the Israeli settlements might grant them the status of an independent state. That's the Trump deal of the century. You will no doubt have noticed it's already been completely forgotten, yeah, superseded no by events because uh, uh, Jared, he's a two-year-old. You know, when you're two years old, I used to work with kids and you'd have these kids, they'd be in the block corner for five minutes, then they would jump to the clay, then they would jump to the painting, then they would jump to, they had no discipline. No focus. That's what makes one of the things that makes a child a child. <clears throat> it's the rare, rare child who will sit down and just focus on one project for a sustained period of time. Uh, Jared is still a two year old in his playroom, going from one to another. So one day he's in charge of Israel Palestine. Another day, he's in charge of the Mexican wall. Now he's in charge of the COVID virus. He's a little child. He's a little child. His preternatural skin. Uh, <laughs> kind of freakish. Kind of freakish, yeah. yeah. I'm glad you're laughing now. Um, the, you said it's not complex, then. Um, what, what do you think should be no, done to resolve this uh, long uh, conflict? Well, politically, I should say, as a matter of, as a factual matter, situations can be uncomplicated. As a political matter, it's a different story. So you take the case during the Democratic primary, Bernie Sanders kept saying the same thing over and over again. He kept saying, we're the only country in the world that doesn't have a national health insurance program. We spend twice as much per capita as any other industrialized country. And it costs 
twice as much as anywhere else, and it's much more inefficient. So as a, as a factual matter, it shouldn't be complicated. We just switch to a system like Canada and Denmark and presumably Switzerland. But as a political problem matter, as Bernie says, you're up against big pharma. You're up against all these corporate lobbies, which have basically bought all the politicians. Uh, and that makes it politically very tough. And it's the same thing with Israel-Palestine conflict. As a factual matter, it's not, com it's not very complicated. You know, you have some issues which would require a certain amount of ingenuity to resolve. For example, the refugee question, it would result, require some ingenuity. But in general, it's a manageable problem. The problem is not the facts of the matter and the resolution of these factual uh, discrepancies. The problem is political. And the problem is Israel, backed by the United States, has enough power, just like Big Pharma has enough power to prevent the implementation of a fairly, fairly simple uh, factual uh, situation. The relation uh, between these nations, um, allies or enemies, is quite hard to follow. Uh, after the flotilla, uh, you wrote the, your last uh, book on that, uh, I Accuse. Uh, we tend to think that the relationship between Israel and uh, Turkey would be somehow compromised, but it's, it's not that easy, it seems. Who are the allies and enemy of both Israel and Palestine? Who can they count on or respectively uh, be afraid of? Um, I don't think there are any givens there. These, they vary over time. Turkey took a pretty strong stand at the time of what was called the Mahdi Marmara incident in May uh, 31st, 2010. But then as Turkey made a major, or I should say Erdogan, made a major strategic miscalculation when he thought that he could, uh, that the Syrian government would fall within six months uh, when the resistance broke out in Syria to the regime. And he intervened and he proved to be wrong. The, no doubt in no small part because of Russian backing uh, and Iranian backing, uh, the Syrian government proved to be much more resilient than Turkey calculated. And then it started to move closer to Israel. Uh, so, and it basically abandoned the people of Gaza whom it championed earlier. So there are no givens in politics, I don't think. Um, right now, as I've said, the Palestine struggle is basically dead. Uh, there's only one dimension of it, which at the moment continues to show light. And it's a strange dimension, actually. There is a lot of activity being fought out by many lawyers at the International Criminal Court. There are several cases, two cases in particular, going on there. So if I can just show you. The 
this is only a partial amount, these are the submissions, the most recent submissions, just the last month, by various lawyers. It, it, it's a humongous. Uh, various lawyers. This is part of it. It's not the whole thing. And it's just the last month. Just the last month. This is from March 15 till now. Uh, people, there's this huge battle being fought out at the International Criminal Court. Um, in some ways, I have to say it's actually, in some ways, it's actually interesting. Is it efficient, it, though? Is it efficient? Like, does it lead to any way? This, uh, this? It's, a, it's a tiny window. You have to remember, but you're way too young to remember. And even if you weren't young, you wouldn't know it. There was a huge battle fought out in the International Court of Justice over South Africa's control of what was called back then Southwest Africa or Namibia. This battle was fought from 1950 to 1971. It kept coming back and back and back and back to the International Court of Justice. Does South Africa have the right to annex Southwest Africa, Namibia, which was the South African mandate from the League of Nation days. And this was fought out. You cannot believe the pile of papers, because I've read through the whole case. You could not believe the pile of papers that accumulated from that case. Now, you can reasonably say, hey, Norm, if you've never heard of it, <laughs> and I've never heard of it, it couldn't have had much effect in ending apartheid in South Africa. It was an element. You know, uh, John Dugard is the world's leading expert, one of the two world's leading experts on the Namibia, Southwest Africa, Namibia case. He lived in South Africa and he knows it was the mass struggle and so forth, the ostracism of South Africa, the military defeats South Africa suffered, uh, in particular at the hands of Cuban troops. Uh, that those were all, and also the, de the, the decomposition of the Soviet Union. And that should not be forgotten as a critical factor because the South African, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, African National Congress was seen back then as a radical socialist place. They were going to nationalize the means of production and so forth. Once the, South, once the Soviet Union imploded, uh, the South African resistance, the African National Congress, uh, proved to be much less scary. It turned out to be people you can quote unquote work with. And um, they just adopted neoliberal policies when they came to power. Um, Nelson Mandela didn't know much about economics, wasn't particularly interested in it. He left it to um, advisors like Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, who's one of the richest men in Africa, and now the current prime minister. Uh, but for, you could say, uh, the legal battles didn't make much of a difference. But when you ask people like Dugard, he's very sober. He was there. He knows what were the factors. He says it was an element. It was an element in the building of world public opinion and so forth. It was an element. Uh, right now, so far as I can see, it's the only venue where a battle is actually being waged. There's no mass resistance in the West Bank. In Gaza, there was an attempt at mass resistance, the Great March of Return. 
it failed for various reasons, mostly having nothing to do with the Gazans. Uh, I think they were truly heroic and they did almost everything right, in my opinion. But they couldn't breach that wall of silence and also of uh, ruthlessness, mercilessness. Uh, so now I follow the ICC. I'm writing on it because it's, mm. as the expression has it in American English, it's the only game in town right now. So the I International think, Criminal Court. That's what yeah. ICC is, right? Yes. Okay. Just a technical question. How do they choose the chief prosecutor in ICC? Because it seems these it's people it's are it's just... It's It, it, I don't know the details. Then the chief prosecutor right now is Fatou Ben Souda, um, and um, a lot of the African countries refer to it as the International Caucasian Court because it only indicts <laughs> African leaders. Mm. That's why nobody's really heard of it. Many people don't even know there is an international criminal court because all it indicts is... <laughs> That's <laughs> madness. And they have, you know, blackface, you know, Fatou Ben Souda, uh, to, uh, she's from Gambia. She was the attorney general during the era of the military junta, and she has a lot of skeletons in her closet. Um, So, but it's, it's something now and you have very little to play with. So mm. that's what I'm, I, I devote the last years of my life to another worthless cause. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worthless. I think it's history, no. Norman. It's history uh, and history will be kind with you and will not be kind with you. I know, me. I know, but I'm, I'm just uh. saying. Um, I, uh, mm -hmm. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Um, I'm, uh, it's now. Yeah, it's been an hour, so I wanted to ask you, how do you feel? And uh, if you feel like we continue a little bit, or if we do that another time with... I think the sensible thing is to do it another time, and we'll yeah. just start a whole new area of inquiry. Yeah, that would be uh, awesome. I would be happy because I followed it closely mm. to discuss the Bernie Sanders. Absolutely. <laughs> And Corbyn as well. The Corbyn anti-Semitism yeah. phenomenon. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah, I would be happy to switch to that. Me too, me too. And to be honest, this channel is your channel. If you want... Anytime in new time, you just call me and we do that. But I will much, much appreciate to treat, to discuss uh, many other subjects with you as I think it's, uh, it's so important and your, uh, your voice is um, of crucial importance. Okay. Well, thank you so much and we'll be in touch. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye.